All right. Gospel of Mark. Now, last week I introduced, whoo, that went loud. I introduced the gospel according to Mark, and the bottom line of that uh, introductory material is that the gospel probably was written in Rome in the mid to late 60s, possibly in the late 50s, written by John Mark, (coughs) excuse me, and it was based significantly on information that John Mark received from the Apostle Peter. And it was originally intended probably for the Gentile Christians in Rome, but John Mark may well have expected it to circulate beyond that community. And its purposes we really have to just speculate about, but it certainly seems was to instruct, to strengthen, and embolden. So last week I went through that and went through a lot of the details about how do we get to that and that kind of thing. But that's pretty much the bottom line of the introductory material. Now this morning we're going to get into the text. And Mark in chapter 1 verse 1, he says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he proceeds to identify that beginning, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He announces that and then he proceeds to identify that beginning with the ministry of John the Baptist. And the events that are associated with it, namely Jesus' baptism and his subsequent testing in the wilderness. Now the term gospel, of course, that term literally means good news. But it was used in the Greco-Roman world. It wasn't a coinage of Christians. This word was used in the Greco-Roman world. And it was used in that world as a celebratory announcement of some major and beneficial event, such as victory in a battle. You know, you can imagine that as your nation depends on its survival, and your nation then has this great victory in a battle, well, that celebratory announcement of that victory was known as gospel. And it was also used for... Um, some uh, major and beneficial events such as the enthronement of a king. So we have Caesar comes to the throne or some king comes to the throne that is going to have this tremendous impact and it is predicted to be a blessing and a good thing. Well, that was known as gospel. And in the Septuagint, which is the, uh, I mentioned it was funny, when we were in Colorado, I was talking to my grandson and I was telling him something. I said, well, in the Septuagint, or you could say Septuagint, I kind of run them together, Septuagint. And uh, his mom said, you know, what you think everybody knows what the Septuagint is? <laughs> I was thinking, I said, I guess I do, I don't know. But anyway, in the Septuagint, so I'll tell you, I'm sure you know, but it's a, it's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament done in the 3rd century B.C. And there you have the verb form of that noun, gospel. The verb form is used in Isaiah 52, 7, regarding the restoration of blessings as a result of God's reign. So we have this celebratory announcement you see of some major and beneficial event in the third century. That verb form is used in connection with uh, the blessing of the end time, the restoration of blessings as a result of God's reign, the blessing of the end time. The eternal state, you see, which is the fullest expression of God's reign. Well, that's the ultimate good news. That's the ultimate good news. So early we start to see this idea of gospel that circulated in the Greco-Roman world being tied to God's work. And according to Mark, this good news, this gospel, it's inextricably bound up with Jesus. He says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, it's bound up with Jesus, who is Messiah. That's, of course, what Christ means. It means anointed one. It means Messiah. So he says the the beginning of the gospel, this good news, which is bound up with Jesus, who is the Messiah. He's the promised and long-awaited king from the line of David who would usher in the kingdom of God, the final state 
and deliver God's people into it. Now, whatever else it may entail, that last phrase, the Son of God, and I put it in brackets because there's a textual issue regarding that. It's probably original, but there, is, there are manuscripts that don't have it, and it's a closer question than you may imagine. But I think it's probably original, but I bracket it just to, to uh, clue you in that there's a textual issue there. But whatever that phrase, Son of God, entails, it reinforces Jesus' identity as the Messiah, in that it was understood from certain texts like Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, Psalm 89, 26, that the Messiah, this ultimate Davidic king, this descendant of David that everybody's waiting for, well, that this ultimate Davidic king, <clears throat> you see from those Psalms, for example, would be the Son of God in a special or ultimate sense. As Solomon had been the son of God in a lesser sense, as you see in 2 Samuel 7, 14. So here, whatever else it means, it emphasizes Jesus as Messiah, as the anointed one, as this long-awaited Davidic king. And he begins the beginning of the gospel, this great celebratory announcement and it's a gospel that is inextricably tied to Jesus, who is the Messiah. The one we've all been waiting for, actually. Now, Mark locates the beginning of the good news relating to Jesus to the ministry of John the Baptist. You see, he would not deny that there's a sense in which that good news began with Christ's birth or began with the eternal intention of God, but he's thinking of its having begun in earnest in the ministry of Jesus that was launched by the ministry of John. John's baptizing ministry, that ministry is frequently presented in the New Testament in that initiating role, in its role of launching the ministry of Jesus Christ. You see it in Matthew 3, 1 to 17, Matthew eleven twelve, 12, Luke, John, Acts. It's frequently presented that way. Now Mark explains in verses 2 to 8 of chapter 1. He explains, I'll say it, as, as it's written in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him, were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I've baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He explains here, Mark explains in verses 2 to 8, that John's role in initiating Christ's ministry, that it was in accordance with what was written in Isaiah the prophet. This wasn't something of recent origin. This isn't something that just happened to come together here in the first century. It was all part of God's long unfolding story. You see, this long unfolding story of God's work through the people of Israel to heal the consequences of sin that had invaded and spoiled God's very good creation in the time of Adam and Eve. This is how long this goes back. This is how long people have been waiting for this restoration work, for God's final intervention, when He's going to put all things right. He's going to fix all things. So this is hard. So this goes back. Isaiah is an 8th century prophet. And here is John here in the 1st century pointing back and saying, 
This, isn't so, this is all part of the plan of God's work. And the reference in verses 2 and 3, it's really a composite. It's a composite reference. You see, it includes part of Exodus 23, verse 20, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, and Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. But Mark probably focuses on Isaiah's contribution to this composite because he's identifying Christ's work and therefore his own work with Isaiah's grand vision of restoration and renewal. You see, that's what he's doing. There also is Jewish precedent for naming only the most important source in composite quotes. So he may just be picking up Isaiah for that, and Mark only develops the portion of the citation dealing with the wilderness, which is the part of the citation that comes from Isaiah. Mark cites the Septuagint version, which makes sense since he's writing to these Gentile Christians in Rome, probably, who don't know Aramaic, don't know Hebrew. So he cites the Septuagint, which specifies that the voice that cries out, the voice is itself in the wilderness. It specifies that and makes that clear, which fits more clearly with John's ministry out in the wilderness, in the Judean desert. See, he is God's messenger. John is God's messenger who calls on God's people to prepare a path for the coming Messiah by getting themselves ready to receive this tremendous, this long-awaited event. So get yourselves ready to receive this ultimate thing that's happening. Daryl Bach in his commentary says, John readies the people for the program of God. A responsive heart is what shows a people ready for God's deliverance to come. So he, he does that. Now the fact John is ministering in the wilderness, that has symbolic significance. It has symbolic significance. God brought Israel into the wilderness from Egypt as a prelude to delivering them into the promised land. They came into the promised land by way of the wilderness. And it was also in the wilderness that Israel was purged of its rebellious generation prior to entering the promised land. So there are is, there is these symbolic attachments to wilderness. And according to Isaiah chapter 40 verse 30, verse 3, chapter 40 verse 3, it's in the wilderness that Israel prepares the way for God's return for blessing. So it's not just coincidental that John's ministry is out in the wilderness. And that link between the wilderness and God's deliverance through the Messiah, that link was understood at that time. The people of that time understood the link between the wilderness and God's, God's deliverance of his people through the Messiah. And you see it, it's reflected in the fact that the Essenes, you know the Essenes, this sect of Judaism in the first century, the Essenes lived out in the wilderness. They lived at Qumran, where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls from. Well, why are they living out there? They're living out there because they understand there's something about the wilderness and a connection to God's working. And so they're out there, and you also see this. You see other supposed deliverers of Israel operating in the wilderness. The first century Jewish historian, Josephus, he mentions a number of messianic movements that began in the Judean desert. Well, why did they begin in the Judean desert? They began in the Judean desert because they saw themselves as messianic movements and they understood the connection between the wilderness and God's deliverance through the Messiah. You may recall in Acts 21, 38, the tribune asked Paul, he says, Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins? Where? Out into the wilderness? What are you thinking? Well, you and I are going, what's up with the wilderness? There's nothing out there. What's this penchant for the wilderness? Well, I'm trying to let you see that there's more going on with that. 
Now, the, the wilderness as the location for the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it also may signify something of the new wine or unshrunk cloth aspects of Christ's work. The fact that his work couldn't be confined. He's doing something new. You see, he's doing something, though, that certainly is rooted in and flows out of all of God's work in the Old Testament with Israel. It's not independent of that, but there is a new aspect or a new element to it. And so he's sitting here, it may be that this wilderness helps to signify that new aspect part. See, rather than beginning at the temple, you see, he's bringing something that can't be confined to the old patterns of Jewish piety. It's rooted in there, but it's coming up and breaking out. And so it may be that this wilderness helps send that signal of the newness of what Jesus is doing. See, rather than beginning at the temple, which was central to Jewish faith and practice, beginning in the wilderness accentuates the newness or the distinctiveness of religious life in the kingdom that Jesus is bringing. So it may have something to do with that. But John proclaimed in verse 4 a baptism of repentance, meaning he immersed the penitent. He immersed, he says in verse 5, those who came confessing their sins and their sins were forgiven in association with that baptism. It was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This is what John is doing. And the people in response to John's call, they were preparing the way for the coming of the great one that John proclaimed, the one whose sandals, John says, as great as John was, John is a prophesied proclaimer of the coming one. As great as John is, he says, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. You see, that's just a way of saying, he's everything and I'm nothing. Now that gives you a hint. See, something about Jesus, John understood Something about the greatness. And so the, the people come in response to this call. In response, they are preparing the way for the coming great one. And by aligning their hearts with the will and the working of God. And included in that was their looking forward to the one to whom John points. John is announcing something. He's announcing the coming of a great one. And part of their coming and falling in line with John's message is, yes, I'm pliable toward God. I'm confessing my sins and I'm also looking for the one you're talking about. I'm looking for this one you're talking about. David Winham in his book on the parables of Jesus, I always like this. He says, the distinction between John and Jesus is the difference between the police outrider in a procession and the royal or other dignitary following in his or her official car or carriage. In other words, John was a prophet looking forward, the last in the line, in fact. Jesus was the one looked forward to the fulfillment of the prophetic hopes. But, and this is the point implied in the parable of the two sons, John and Jesus were part of the same cavalcade. The same revolutionary movement. You see, they are together in ushering in. John launches Christ's ministry, announces coming, and then Jesus comes. They are together, working together in the plan of God in bringing this tremendous work to us. And the fact John's clothes are made of camel's hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist... That was a distinctive symbolic identification with the prophet Elijah. Elijah is described this way in 2 Kings chapter 1 verse 8. Now literally it describes, it describes Elijah there as a hairy man. 
okay? But the translations get it right when they realize it's referring to a garment of hair. He's a hairy man because he's wearing a garment of hair as that clothing was typical of prophets. And you see that, for example, in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 4. Now, based on Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, Based on that text, the Jews expected Elijah to return in advance of the Messiah. You remember an angel told Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 verse 17? The angel tells Zechariah that John would go before the Lord, what? In the spirit and power of Elijah. He's going to go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Well, the Jews are looking for Elijah to come before this great event of the Messiah's entrance into the world. And here John is told, the angel tells Zechariah that about John. And Jesus elsewhere, he expressly identifies John as the Elijah who was to come. You see that in Mark 9, 11 to 13, Matthew 11, 14, 17, 10 to 13. So Jesus expressly does it. Now John himself, you remember John chapter 1 Verse 21, John the Baptist himself, he denied that he was Elijah. He denied he was Elijah. Now, he did that probably because he was not literally Elijah. That's probably what his denial is based on. See, that's how most Jews understood the prophecy. They're thinking of a literal return of Elijah. You see, he was, however, he was the prophesied Elijah. Meaning he was the one who would come in the spirit and power of Elijah as the forerunner of the Messiah. J.H. Bernard says, in a sense, John the Baptist was the Elijah of Jewish expectation. And so Jesus declares. Right? So we know that's true. Jesus declares that. But in the sense in which the Jewish emissaries put the question, art thou Elijah? Are you literally Elijah? The true answer was no. For while the Baptist fulfilled the preliminary ministry, which Malachi had spoken in 4 or 5, uh, he was not Elijah returned to earth in bodily form. And I think that's, at least that was useful to me to, to recognize that. Now, because John's ministry was in the wilderness, his diet included locusts and wild honey. Those are things that would be available to him in that environment. And locusts are, in fact, they are listed in Leviticus chapter 11 among the foods that Israelites were permitted to eat. So he's not eating something unclean there. Now, John says that he, he baptized them. John says that, that he baptized them with water. But the exalted one coming after him, he says, will baptize with her in the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes you have people say, well, John says he baptized with water. Whereas Jesus, he says, will baptize in the Holy Spirit, meaning instead of with water. That's not what he means at all. Here's what Robert Stein, his very well-known commentator, he says, uh, Since John, Jesus, and the early church all practiced water baptism, it would be an error to think that Mark intended his readers to interpret the verb baptize in two very different ways. The first literally for John's baptism and the second figuratively for Jesus' baptism. No doubt Mark intended that his readers should interpret John's words in light of their Christian baptism. He's writing in the, in the you know, mid to late 60s. Right? That's what he's writing the gospel. So he's writing to an audience. You have to know how they're going to understand what he's saying. He says the difference between the baptism of Jesus and that of John did not involve the form of baptism, immersion, or the medium of baptism, water, but the benefit associated with it. Both practiced an immersion in water associated with repentance. Both associated baptism with forgiveness of sins. John, however, was pointing forward to the day when the stronger one would bring with him the arrival of the new age and the spirit as the guarantee of the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is doing something. John is on the precipice. He's announcing he's the herald of this great inbreaking kingdom bringer. And the baptism that he would administer 
would carry with it differences because of the work he's doing. So this idea and that work is tied to the Holy Spirit and other things. Now, interestingly, the, the first century Jewish historian Josephus, he speaks of John and his ministry. In, the, in his work, The Antiquities of the Jews, he confirms that John was called the Baptist. And he confirms that John was a good man who commanded the Jews to exercise righteousness toward one another and piety toward God, that is, to repent and to come to baptism. He, he confirms that crowds came to him and they were moved by his words and that Herod had him thrown in prison and put to death. All of that. This Jewish historian confirms. Now, Josephus doesn't mention the more apocalyptic aspects of John's preaching. The claim that God in this launch of Christ's ministry, that God is breaking into history in a climactic way. He doesn't talk about that or he doesn't and he doesn't talk about his connection with Jesus. But as Mark Strauss notes, that's not surprising Given Josephus' general disdain for messianic movements, Josephus was no fan of messianic movements. Because here he was a prisoner of the Jewish revolt in 60, 66 to 70. He winds up going over to the Romans. So he's got no, you know, he doesn't care for these messianic movements that he looks and say, look what happened to our nation. So it's not surprising he wouldn't want to be pushing that. And we see in 9 to 11, we have Jesus' baptism by John in the Jordan. And Mark notes here, he says that in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open <clears throat> and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son with you. I am well pleased. So Mark notes that Jesus came from Nazareth, which is a small and relatively unknown village in southwest Galilee. So you see it right up here, Nazareth. And he's probably baptizing somewhere down around in here, although there's some dispute about the precise location of John's baptism. But he says Jesus came from Nazareth. See, there's Samaria up there. He came there and he's, be, he's being baptized there. Now, according to Luke, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, John's ministry began in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Now, you say, well, that seems pretty clear. Ah, but it could be either A.D. 27 or it could be A.D. 30, depending on whether Luke's referring to the beginning of Tiberius's co-regency with Augustus which he had for a few years, or he's referring to the beginning of his soul reign. All right, so that gives you two different points. It could be 27, 15 years after that. It depends where you're starting. If you start at the beginning of the co-regency, well, then we're talking 27. If you're starting at the beginning of his soul rule, well, then we're talking 30. Okay, so there's some ambiguity there depending on, on what, he's, what he's talking about when, he's, when he says that. Now, since Herod died in 4 B.C., probably, more and more people I see are arguing that maybe Herod died in 2 or maybe 1 B.C. But the, the standard historical understanding was 4. But as I say, there's a possibility that that's off. But since Herod probably died in 4 B.C., and Jesus is born before Herod died... That puts Jesus' birth probably around 5 B.C. I know that sounds kind of screwy, but uh, that's just how it is, and there's a reason for that. Okay, but he's probably born around 5 B.C., and according to Luke 3.23, he's about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Okay, so that fits more comfortably with John's ministry beginning around 27, right? Because if he's born around five, then you got him like 32, something like that. That fits more comfortably with the 27 than with the 30. That would put Jesus' ministry from, from roughly 27 to 30, which fits with the statement in John 2.20 that near the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Herod's temple construction had been ongoing for about 46 years. Okay, so that begins in, in uh, 20 B.C., 
So then you go to AD 27 and you're right at 46 years. So that, that, that seems to be the thing. Now Mark simply reports the baptism without providing any dialogue between Jesus and John or any comment on the reason Jesus was baptized. I mean, that's, that's rather interesting, right? I mean, in Jesus' case, he certainly wasn't, it, what, his baptism certainly wasn't a repentance-based baptism that was accompanied by forgiveness of sins because he's sinless. Okay, he's sinless. Mark knows that well. All the Christians, he's right, they know that well. So it wasn't a repentance-based baptism that resulted in forgiveness. Now in Matthew, okay, we're away from Mark, and I try to fight the temptation. Always when you're teaching the gospel, you want to go and talk about what the other gospel writers say. Some of that's essential. I'm going to try to hold it down. But some of this, for example, in Mark chapter 3, verse 15, there you have Jesus, he, he urges a hesitant John. You can see John, he's saying, I'm not worthy to touch the guy's sandals. And Jesus, he's administering a baptism of repentance for forgiveness. Now here comes Jesus. And you see John going, hey man, no dice with that. And so Jesus has to urge this reluctant herald. He urges him to go through with the baptism and he says to fulfill all righteousness. You know, to fulfill all righteousness. Now I take that to mean to fill to the full, to maximize righteousness, not only within Israel, but within all creation. You see, that result of maximizing righteousness is tied to John's baptism of Jesus in that in keeping with John's Elijah role as the herald and forerunner of the Lord, God ordained that baptism, John's baptism, to be the launch of Christ's ministry through which righteousness ultimately will permeate everything. You see, here he is launching Christ's ministry. Here is the kingdom bringer. After all of these ages, he's here on the scene. John announces the kingdom bringer is here. And through this ministry of Christ, what is going to come of that? What is going to come of his bringing the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God. And what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God in its fullest, ultimate manifestation is where righteousness permeates everything. You see? So this is what I think he's talking about when he, when he says that. You see, so, and the pivotal nature, the pivotal nature of the baptism, it's evident in the fact that a requirement for being an apostle to replace Judas was that the candidate had accompanied the disciples, what? Beginning from the baptism of John. You see, th this, is a, this is a pivotal moment in world history because here comes the launching of this ministry through which the kingdom of God is invading. And so there's nothing like it. And in keeping with the pivotal nature of that event, Jesus sees the physical heavens ripped open. You see, exposing the interlocking dimension of heaven. We oftentimes think of, you know, this reality in a certain way. But, you know, we know so little about reality. We think we know what, how it's all built, and it's just a joke. It's a joke. So it looks like there's more of this interlocking. You know, I, I think like, I, I get people, look, look, think Twilight Zone. You see, think dimensions that are somehow interlocking and overlapping, and yet you and I exist here in this dimension, and we're unaware of the interlocking dimension that's right there. But Jesus, he sees this uh, heaven ripped open, exposing uh, this interlocking dimension from which the Spirit descends on him like a dove. It describes really the descent of the Spirit. And Jesus is anointed by the Spirit, as Luke puts it in chapter 4, verse 18, in preparation for his ministry. And then God announces from heaven, you're my son, the beloved, with you 
I am well pleased. You see, this brief announcement, that's probably an allusion to Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, where God speaks of the nations raging against His Davidic king. And it's probably an allusion to Isaiah 42, 1, where the Spirit-endowed servant of the Lord is identified as God's chosen one. So this is big stuff. You know, I'm looking at all the history of the world, and I think as the world looks at it, well, we had this battle over here and we had this stuff. I'm looking at the flow of history of the world, and we're talking about this is momentous. You see, this is momentous here. Now, John, we know from John chapter 1, and Jesus, we know from Mark 1.10, they saw the descent of the Spirit. But it's unclear whether others saw the descent of the Spirit or whether anyone other than Jesus heard the heavenly voice. Now, decades after Jesus' ministry, his resurrection and ascension, when Mark is writing, Mark and his readers, they certainly know Jesus' identity. Mark opens up in chapter 1 where he says the Son of God. You know, Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So they all know this, you see. They understand who he is. But that recognition comes only gradually as they live out the story that's explained in the gospel. You see, they know it now. But as we look in the gospel, you're going to see a gradual unfolding of Jesus' identity. And so that's what we'll be seeing. Now, Mark says in verses 12 and 13 that Jesus, under the compulsion of the Spirit, he went into the wilderness for 40 days where he's tempted by Satan. Now, unlike Matthew and Luke, he doesn't elaborate on the temptation. He doesn't elaborate on them. Mark's point seems to be that as the good news relating to Jesus, as that good news began in earnest with the launching of his ministry at John's baptism, so too did the spiritual war with Satan. That seems to be what Mark is indicating. The spirit thrusts Jesus into the deep end of the pool so to speak, puts him out in the deep end of the pool to experience the nature and intensity of the spiritual battle that has been joined to taste the wiles of the enemy in a state of deprivation and physical want. And that experience will serve Jesus, the God-man, as he walks the road of crucifixion. You and I can't imagine what it was like for him to walk the road of crucifixion knowing who he is, knowing that he is God the Son, knowing that he is sinners, knowing how people have rejected God, knowing that he has the power that if I simply speak, this all goes away. And yet faithful to death, drank the cup dry. You see, he's in a battle like no other. He is in a battle like no other. And so this serves him well as he walks that road. Now Mark alone, of all the gospel writers, he alone refers to the wild animals in the wilderness. See, to the wild animals that are out there. These dangerous, wild critters out there, which heightens the inhospitableness of the environment, and thus it magnifies the hardship under which the temptation was experienced. Now, it's just possible. It's just possible that that Mark's specific mention of the wild animals, he does that because at that time, the time he's writing the gospel, Christians in Rome were being thrown to wild animals. It's just possible that he alone makes mention of that. Because Christians are being thrown to animals by Nero in Rome. Now in that case, Mark would be encouraging the saints there to faithfulness by noting that the Lord had been faithful in the midst of wild animals as you are called to be. Now doesn't that that tell you something though about uh, what Christianity is and how just sickening it is 
how people have turned or tried to turn Christianity into some meaningless, pale, I don't care. When you think about people being thrown to animals in loyalty to Jesus, and it's just something. Now, the fact angels were serving Jesus in the wilderness, that reinforces the signific- his significance and that of his work. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God, and He's carrying out God's grand plan and purposes. He's not some tragic, deluded figure, some nut who's out here thinks he's on some mission from God when he's not. He's on the greatest divine mission there has ever been. So it's not surprising that God's angels are there ministering to Him, testifying that, look, He is the one. He is the real deal. Now, Mark doesn't describe Christ's triumph over Satan in the wilderness. He doesn't describe it, but that's understood from the continuing narrative. It's understood he's victorious there. For example, he's reported in 126 and 134 as having authority over demons. So it's understood, but Mark doesn't report it. Now, in 14 and 15, I know the bell's going to ring soon. 14 and 15, he says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And this is a very bad place to be ending. Because boy, do I want to talk about this. But time constraints. All right, now with Matthew and Luke, Mark does not report the time that Jesus' ministry overlapped with that of John the Baptist prior to John's arrest. He doesn't report the time between Mark 1.13 and Mark 1.14. See, that overlap, when Jesus' ministry overlapped with John, and that journey to Galilee through Samaria, that's reported only in the first four chapters of the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't talk about that. The synoptics move from Jesus testing in the wilderness. They move from that straight to his ministry in Galilee after John's arrest. See, seemingly to emphasize the distinction between Jesus and John in terms of ushering in the new age. The kingdom of God. John was the last of the old age. He was the herald of the coming kingdom, of the Messiah, the kingdom bringer. But Jesus is what? He's the new dawn. He's the new dawn. So it seems that the synoptic writers are emphasizing emphasizing that distinction. They move right from the testing up to the ministry in Galilee. And then they go on from there. And we will pick up, Lord willing, next week. Thank you for coming.